I'd like you to welcome you all to our panel on career opportunities and constitutional litigation. It's my honor to introduce the moderator for this panel, Judge Drew Tipton of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas. Judge Tipton graduated from South Texas College of Law before serving as a law clerk to Judge Rainey on the court for which he now sits. Um, he also served our country as a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps Reserves before having a distinguished career in private practice. He worked with Baker Hotsteller for 20 years and was a partner there when Judge Tr uh, President Trump nominated him to his seat in 2020. So please join me in welcoming Judge Tipton. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to uh, Lisa and Abby and all of those who have um, uh, done a, an amazing job. This is a great location, even for an Aggie. So I'm an Aggie and I'm in kind of enemy territory. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, the facility's great, the people are great, um, except for the parking garage. Did anybody else have any problems navigating the parking garage if you parked here? So um, I will just say, as I arrived yesterday and, and found my way to park, did y'all see that there's a section of the parking garage that says it's, it's not for tall vehicles, it says no tall vehicles. Um, and so, and it was in burnt orange. And as I was walking to check in, um, I heard this really loud clang, a metal clang, and I, I looked, to my left where I saw Judge Brantley Starr, he's often on the left, um, and so um, <laughs> he, uh, he had hit uh, the t that sign which was flailing about madly, um, and, and then uh, a few minutes later I saw him carrying some pink pillows and some toys uh, up to his room, which he says was for his kids. But um, <laughs> anyway, those of you who are in the Dallas division of the Northern District of Texas, rest easy knowing that the future of the country is safe in his hands. So um, I'd like to introduce the, um, the panel that we have here. Uh, the topic is uh, really directed to uh, how we get uh, constitutional law practice uh, from a, a younger or newer lawyer, lawyer's perspective. And we have some people who have uh, done that in a very distinguished way. Uh, Ryan Bangert uh, is, uh, serves as senior counsel and vice president for legal strategy at the Alliance for Defending Freedom. He oversees the Center for Academic Freedom, the Conscious Team, and the Regulatory Litigation Team. And he assists ADF leadership with uh, strategic initiatives. And before that, he uh, worked as the deputy uh, for legal counsel and deputy first assistant in the attorney general's office for the state of Texas, where he oversaw the state's lit special litigation uh, unit, which handled uh, a lot of the critical litigation that makes headlines uh, in the state. And before that, he worked for a uh, Missouri a attorney general that you might know, who's now a senator, Josh Hawley. Um, uh, overseeing the civil litigation portfolio there. Before that, he was a partner um, at Baker Botts, um, and he graduated from Oral Roberts University, had a JD from uh, Southern Methodist University, and he clerked for Judge Patrick Higginbotham on the Fifth Circuit. Um, and so, uh, before I introduce the rest, why don't you give us the commercial for the, um, the uh, organization or the entity that you're here to speak on behalf of today? Sure, thank you, Judge. Um, I think you can tell from my resume, I've just sort of forced gumped my way through the conservative movement uh, over the years. But um, I work with Alliance Defending Freedom now. I have the privilege of working with that group for about the past two years. And ADF is a, is a nonprofit group, uh, which I know many of you are here to hear about working for nonprofits that do constitutional litigation. So that's squarely what we do. Uh, we've been around for about 30 years. Uh, we litigate frequently before the U.S. Supreme Court. Many people know, know us as the masterpiece cake shop firm, but we're, we're much more than that. We're much more than a cake shop firm. Mm. Uh, we uh, generally, our mission, as we state it, is to keep the doors open for the gospel. And that includes a lot of different things, which I'll be happy to talk about today. Uh, we litigate in courts. Uh, we advocate on behalf of parental rights, academic freedom, conscience, uh, we also have a regulatory practice group. Yes, you can use the APA to keep the doors open for the gospel, and we do that on a regular basis. Uh, we also engage in legislative uh, advocacy. We have uh, folks who, ad who advocate before both uh, state legislatures and the federal legislatures. Uh, we also have a very pronounced communications shop, which uh, we'll also be talking about, I think, later today. Uh, one thing you'll find is you cannot do constitutional litigation in today's world without communicating well. And that communications, uh, those communications fall along many different lines, social media, uh, traditional press, print media, visual media, radio, as well as, as uh, communications 
uh, direct, direct communications to your, your constituents. And so uh, it's, a, it's a very fascinating organization. We also have a very large international component, which many people don't know about. We are overseas uh, significantly. Uh, we work with the UN, we work in India. Uh, right now we have active matters in roughly 100 countries around the world. Uh, so we're, we're very busy uh, overseas as well. So it's a, it's a keeps us busy. All right. Uh, and then next I'd like to introduce Keisha Russell, uh, who is with the First Liberty Institute, um, and they concentrate on religious liberty matters and First Amendment rights as well. She attended Emory University School of Law, where she was heavily involved in their uh, Center for Study of Law and Religion, which she also clerked for. Uh, prior to that, she was uh, the 2011 uh, Teach for America Corps member in, Atlanta, in the Atlanta Public Schools. And as an elementary special education teacher, which is near and dear to my heart, because that's what my wife is, um, uh, she taught students with ADD, and my wife deals with that in me, um, and she, emotional behavior <laughs> disorders and learning disabilities. Keisha is, Keisha is most passionate about protecting religious freedom uh, for children in America's schools. She appears on a lot of numerous uh, 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 media uh, things like Fox and Friends um, and, and CBN and is uh, quoted in uh, the Daily Signal, the Richmond Times Dispatch. She earned her uh, Bachelor of Communications from the University of Central Florida and a Master's in Teaching from the University of uh, Southern California. So Keisha, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the First Liberty Institute? So First Liberty is an amazing uh, organization and we focus on religious liberty litigation. We represent all religions um, and obviously we're a nonprofit, so we do that for free. We litigate all over the country and um, my favorite aspect of working at First Liberty is all of the students and teachers and people in education that we represent uh, because obviously education is such an important uh, passion of mine and I feel like right now we're really in a battle for the mind of the next generation. So it's really important to represent young people so that they are able to be passionate about their religious beliefs in school, out of school, et cetera. So that is what we do at First Liberty and it's amazing and I love it. And uh, can't wait to tell you all about it. <laughs> and then next we have Arif Panjou, who's the managing attorney uh, for the Institute for Justice. Um, he leads uh, the Institute for uh, Justice Texas office and litigates cases that also involve free speech and property rights, economic liberty, and, um, and, and economic educational choice. He's co-counsel in a case, a small case that just came out of the Supreme Court, uh, Carson uh, v. Macon, um, and um, I'm sure he'll be anxious to tell us about uh, that. He, his work has been featured by outlets including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, uh, and on and on. He sits on the board for the Freedom of Information Foundation uh, of Texas, and he graduated with honors from Southern Methodist University, um, and uh, he clerked on the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary. And he lives here in Austin. So tell us a little bit about the um, Institute for Justice. The Institute for Justice is the National Law Firm for Liberty. Mm -hmm. uh, we started in 1991. And for the first five years, we won no cases. But <laughs> um, our focus is to impact all areas of public interest law, whether it's litigation, whether it's media and framing uh, issues that matter to our liberty and the pillars of a free society in the court of public opinion, activism, legislation, um, and you name it. We try to make an impact everywhere we go. And one of those things uh, that I was talking to Scott Bullock uh, before just this, pa this past week, one of the things that kind of guided IJ early on, um, and, and if you work in the public interest world, you'll find some old swag or old kind of coffee mugs with a quote. One of the earliest ones uh, he shared um, really rings true today, and it's from Thomas Paine, and it says, tyranny like hell, uh, is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, uh, the more glorious the triumph. And that's still true today. IJ takes on some of the hardest cases to win in the courts. We take on rational basis review cases. We take on property rights cases, which unfortunately have been put on the constitutional back burner or the constitutional junk drawer, if you listen to Clark Neely, and I agree with him. We defend school choice laws. We defend the right to speak freely, especially when that speech is designed to have meaningful impacts, uh, whether in the political sphere or within the, con the frame of your occupation. Um, and we take on immunity doctrines because we believe that if there's a remedy, um, then courts should enforce it. If there's a right, there should be a remedy. And one of our newest areas is the Fourth Amendment. We believe that it's the, the right to be secure. It's grounded in very deep traditions that are rooted in property all the way back to Magna Carta. Uh, and we intend to vindicate that across the board. 
So IJ litigates everywhere under 51 constitutions. Uh, we now are winning cases a lot more than we did mm -hmm. in the first five years. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to do it in a very principled way as happy warriors. Um, and we always have call uh, out for some of the best talent that both exhibits um, the true essence of a public interest lawyer when you have it here, that you're motivated by a desire to advance a common mission, uh, have the skills necessary to do that at the level that, that we have to do it on, um, but also at the same time that you're willing to um, bring up everyone with you. Um, it's not a one-person game at IJ. It's truly a, as George Will called us, um, a merry band of libertarian litigators. So we're happy to talk about that today. All right. And then uh, next to our reef is Rebecca or Becky uh, Ricketts. Uh, she joined Beckett Law uh, this year, 2022, uh, and she focuses on First Amendment and appellate litigation. Uh, before that, she served as an assistant United States attorney for the Northern District of Texas. Uh, there, she prosecuted a wide range of violent crimes and cyber offenses, including sex trafficking, cyber stalking, carjacking, kidnapping, firearm offenses, and drug trafficking. Before that, she uh, was an associate at Gibson Dunn here in Dallas, where she practiced appellate and constitutional law, as well as complex commercial litigation and administrative law. Uh, and before that, she clerked for uh, somebody named Clarence Thomas, um, <laughs> I think I've heard of him, um, on the Supreme Court, and then Judge Jose Cabranes on the Second Circuit, uh, Judge Richard Sullivan, uh, who was in the Southern District of New York. Uh, she got her law to, received her law degree from Yale Law School um, and uh, her undergraduate degree from the University of Texas here at Austin. So tell us a little bit about uh, Beckett Law. Thank you, Judge, mm. and uh, thank you to the Federalist Society mm. and um, especially to Lisa and Abby um, and Natalie Thompson for organizing all of this. Um, I work at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Uh, our motto is religious liberty for all. Um, we are also a public interest law firm that focuses specifically on First Amendment and religious liberty issues. We have other great friends at the table. Um, I, I view us all as um, on the same team, maybe with slightly different dockets, um, but our organization specifically focuses on, um, or is, is sort of based on the central insight that religious liberty, we believe, is part of the created order um, and belongs to all people. And so we represent um, uh, religious people of all stripes. Um, I have clients right now who are Jewish universities and orders of Catholic nuns. Um, uh, we, have, we have sort of a whole range of litigation implicating free speech, free exercise, religion clause defenses. We have some fun Fourth Amendment stuff going on. I completely agree with Arif. That's the, the wave of the future. Um, we're relatively small. We're about um, 50 total employees scattered across the country. Um, we specialize um, in appellate, but we do lots of trial court work too. And um, I'm having a great time. I'm certainly the newest kid on the block on mm. this panel in terms of full-time um, constitutional litigation, um, but it really is a dream job and I'm happy to be here. And last but certainly not least is Chance Weldon, who is the Senior Attorney and Director of Litigation for the Center for the American Future at the Texas uh, Public Policy Foundation. Um, since joining the foundation, Chance has worked on some of the most important cases that they've had, which ranges from uh, property rights owners uh, along the Red River in North Texas uh, to striking down the city of Austin's uh, short-term rental regulations um, and to defending people's ability to maintain their property uh, without uh, suffering uh, penalties under certain conditions. Uh, before that, he served as a fellow at the Pacific Legal Foundation uh, in Sacramento, California, and the Institute for Justice in Austin here. Um, as a fellow, he worked on uh, a wide breadth of litigation involving economic liberty, free speech, school choice, and the like. He earned his uh, uh, JD from the University of Houston, where, uh, and then uh, he also received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Houston. So Chance, tell us about the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Thank you, Judge. Um, glad to back clean up down here. So. <laughs> but uh, like everyone else on this table, I, I sue the government for a living, which is an absolutely sweet gig if you can find somebody that'll let you do it. And I don't think I'll ever stop. Um, the Center for the American Future, we focus on you know, putting government back in its constitutionally mandated box and hopefully over time making that box smaller. Like everyone else here, we do pro bono, uh, impact litigation, where we try and find cases that really move the law in a direction that allow people to use their property, to run their businesses, and overall just run their lives without arbitrary government interference. 
Another way to put that is that we file cases that are designed to establish the fact that there are meaningful judicially enforceable limitations on government power, whether that be uh, administrative agencies at the federal level, which is the vast majority of our docket, or whether that be local land use regulations. Um, we began back in 2015. Folks who know TPPF know that TPPF is one of the oldest, largest, and I like to say most influential free market think tanks in Texas. We have about 100 people on staff, but our litigation center has only been around since about 2015. Um, and we have about eight attorneys. We have a clerkship program every summer um, where we try and find uh, good law students that we can indoctrinate in the ways of public interest litigation um, and tell them that there are more important things than making money in this field. Um, and uh, that you can fight for something that you truly believe in. And I have the, the privilege and the honor of leading a bunch of folks who get up every day to fight what they, for what they believe in and to fight the good fight and wear the white hat. And I can tell you, getting to stay up till 10 o'clock at night with these guys filing emergency injunctions where we decide that maybe it'd be cool to spend two additional hours digging through the Federalist Papers for an originalist argument is about the coolest thing that you can do in law. So um, yeah, with that, that's what we do at CAF. Well, I appreciate that. And I would also appreciate it if you wouldn't file those emergency injunctions at 10 o'clock. <laughs> so, um, so um, you know, the, the point of uh, today is to uh, have uh, newer lawyers or younger lawyers um, find out how they can get involved in uh, constitutional litigation at a public interest um, entity like we've just heard. And, and it sounds like we've had uh, a lot of different paths on how to get there. So did you know, I'll, I'll just go down the line, Ryan, did, did you know that you wanted to be um, in this business and, and how did you get there? What was, the, what was your path to, to pursuing public interest constitutional litigation? That's a, the short answer is no, uh, I did not. In fact, when I was uh, in the process of asking my then future father-in-law uh, for permission to marry my wife, he said, what, what is your degree in? And I said, political science. And he said, well, I hope you're going to law school. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for law school after that. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, so it was not exactly the, a straight line. Um, I, I, it's an interesting thing, it's an interesting question. I think it's a chicken and egg question sometimes. Um, how do you, do you start off with a desire to do public interest work or does that desire sort of come to you later in your career? Um, I, I think that directionally you have a sense, the people who I have encountered in my life who are making a big impact usually don't start off with a clear, defined 20-year plan. There is no such thing as a clear, defined 20-year plan. And if you think that exists, you're wrong. It, it, you can't create such a thing in this life. It's too uncertain. Um, but oftentimes, you have a kernel of an idea. Um, how many of you have heard of Patrick Lencioni? Patrick Lencioni, he's a, I, know, I knew Jeff would have heard of, of Patrick Lencioni, of course. Uh, Patrick Lencioni is a uh, management consultant um, and also a motivational speaker and very successful. He, he has a practice out in Silicon Valley, uh, a best-selling author, and he never set out to be that. There's no path to becoming a best-selling author, motivational speaker, and management consultant the way he is. But he had the kernel of an idea when he was very young. He saw his father come home from work every day saying the same thing over and over, which was, I really don't enjoy my work, and it's because management at my company just doesn't, they don't know what they're doing. And if, they, if only management could figure out how to manage well, I would be much happier in my job. And, and that stuck with young Patrick. And that became the passion of his life. And he went to McKinsey and ultimately formed his own practice group. And he didn't have a clear line of sight into making that happen, but he had this kernel of an idea. And so when I was early in my time at Oral Roberts University, I, I saw that people of faith were more often than not poorly represented in the public space, in the law, in politics, and it just stuck with me and it bothered me. And when I was, I was growing up, I did a lot of work on campaigns and I did a lot of work in politics. And there was this trope that was going about at the time. I won't tell you how long ago it was because it'll really date me, but let's just suffice it to say, Bill Clinton wasn't yet in office. So, um, but there was this trope that was going around about believers and people of faith in politics. It was, I quote, I think it was from the New York Times, they are poor, uneducated, and easy to command. And that was, that was just an accepted, it was a given. And I thought, well, that can't be right, because I know a lot of people who, of faith who are not poor, uneducated, and easy to command. I know a lot of people of faith who actually want to make a difference and impact their culture. But we were very poorly represented. People of faith were very poorly represented. So it stuck with me. And as, as I went through my career, that idea never left me. 
And eventually I circled back to it serendipitously. Uh, and I, I kind of stayed around the hoop. If, if you ever heard that term, you kind of hang around the hoop long enough, it kind of finds you. I did a lot of volunteer attorney work with First Liberty Institute when Jeff was there the first time around um, and just stayed with it. And eventually it found me. Uh, so I think that's, you don't have this well-formed idea often. Oftentimes you have a sense of purpose and mission and directionally that orients you. Hmm. Keisha, uh, how, tell us about your path uh, to public interest work. So. Well, very, you know, very similar to Ryan's actually. Um, I did not expect to land at First Liberty or to be doing religious liberty litigation. You know, I started in higher education. I worked in uh, colleges and universities for a little while and I really enjoyed that and I felt led to teach. Um, and so I started uh, teaching fourth and fifth grade special education in Atlanta public schools. I kind of felt it would be temporary, um, that it was sort of a training ground for something else. And everything I do is sort of guided by my faith. And so I, you know, felt like that was where I belonged at that point. And so I just, you know, really put my heart and soul into teaching those students. And many of them were, you know, in Atlanta public schools, the, the area where I taught, it was the worst area of Atlanta. So those students saw a lot of, um, a lot of violence and they had a lot of adult problems um, to be 10 and 11 years old. And so I was able to really learn how to advocate for them. Because um, not only did they have sort of these special needs, ADHD and things like that, but they had behavioral disorders. So the students I taught were actually not allowed to be in the general education classroom anymore. They were pulled out of that classroom. Um, and so I was teaching what they call a self-contained unit. Um, and so part of my job was not just to educate them, but to teach them how to manage their behavior, to teach them self-control and um, confidence and things like that. Um, and, and once I felt like that path was completed, right around <laughs> the third year I was teaching, I felt really called to go to law school because a lot of people ask me, how or teaching and law related. How did you end up going from teaching to being a lawyer? And to me, they're so related because I'm always advocating uh, for my clients and I was always advocating for my students too. And so I went to law school really with the intention of working in education. I didn't even know that what I do now existed when I started law school. Um, I didn't know religious liberty litigation was something that you could do. And so I was really just kind of following uh, the passion that I had for advocacy um, and for defending people. And so once I got to Emory, um, an incredible man named Mark Goldfeder uh, really sort of adopted me and pulled me in. Um, and he works for uh, ACLJ and um, was on uh, Donald Trump's legal team for a while. And so he taught me a lot about religious liberty litigation and that's where I kind of fell in love with um, this whole area of law and uh, because of my faith I thought wow how incredible would it be to defend people of faith to defend churches and synagogues and um, people who like Ryan said earlier paving the way for the gospel and at that point I really truly believed that religious liberty is a cornerstone right if you lose the right to practice your religion if you lose the right to uh, believe in whatever God you choose to believe in, then everything else comes after that. You lose your freedom of association. You definitely use your freedom, lose your freedom of speech. And so it, it became sort of central uh, to my career at that point. And I knew that that's what I was going to be doing for a really long time. And so I really just kind of followed uh, the passion and, and what I believed uh, God wanted me to be doing at that point. And it led me to First Liberty. Um, and like Ryan said, you really don't have... I mean, I, I know some young people now that I mentor and things, and they're like 20, and they're like, oh, I want to do this with my life. And I'm like, you don't know what you want to do with your life. Like, you don't, <laughs> you don't know. I mean, you just don't. And you, you might have all of these plans, but those plans will always be adjusted. Um, and you really have to be flexible. Um, and if, you, if you're willing to do that, you'll find you know, the right spot. Arif, how about you? Did you know that you wanted to be a constitutional law litigator? Uh, is that the goal you had in mind? I, not only did I not know I was going to do this, I knew almost no lawyers. <laughs> uh, we, we, our family came to this country in the 1980s and um, from both rural Quebec uh, and West Africa is where we split our childhood. And my parents come from very different parts of the world and different cultural backgrounds. But the one thing that kind of held true is that th they both have experienced different types of adversity where advocacy would have, uh, and meaningful advocacy would have been 
helpful uh, to, to teach them um, that there are ways to fight back, to kind of go through uh, the adversity that you have. And that kind of stuck with me as a kid. And then, growing up in the United States, you, you, it's a whole different experience. Um, so my first job after college was to work at Dell Computer just down the road here in Round Rock because that's what you did. I mean, it was a, 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 where I was lived in a tech heavy at the time, still, still is, city, and it was a nice gig. But I, I was just not satisfied there. I always had the, like, like we've heard previously uh, from Keisha and Ryan, just you know, kind of this intrinsic motivation that hadn't fully formed, but it was there, that, that, that was enough to guide me away from where I was and maybe towards where I needed to go. I just didn't know exactly what I was gonna do. Uh, but so I went to law school after seven years at Dell, and it was during law school that I discovered the Federal Society, and it was during law school that I met Clark Neely, who's a friend of mine now, through a speaking engagement at the Federal Society. And as I was learning the law and, uh, and meeting lawyers for the first time en masse and just seeing how they developed their minds early on, um, here comes an IJ lawyer that just you know, blows it out of the water and explains things in a very different way uh, that, that I totally connected with. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I sought out IJ um, and, and now I manage the office here in Texas. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really what it was. Once, I, once you see, timing is really important. Uh, when you're, timing can, can hurt you if you make decisions too fast in your career because you foreclose other opportunities. Uh, but at the same time, you need to be able to seize them. So if you get yourself to a point where you have the motivation the principle and also the commitment that you're willing to give, your time to advance a cause. When those three things aligned, uh, that, that's when you push the green button and you go. And that happened for me during law school, thanks to the Federal Society and thanks to IJ. That's, mm. that's what I did. But it took years to get there. Mm -hmm. So Becky, you came from big law and then were a federal prosecutor. Was, was it always percolating in the back of your mind that you wanted to be a constitutional law litigator or did that just kind of happen later on? So I would say yes and no, Judge, mm -hmm. and I know you love it when oh, answers, great. lawyers answer questions that way. Um, I, I relate a lot to Ryan's comment about having the kernel of an idea. Um, I think if you had asked me going into law school, Becky, what's your dream job as a lawyer? I probably would have said litigating religious liberty cases at a public interest law firm, even though I had never heard of Beckett or First Liberty or ADF at that point in time. Now, as it turned out, it took me the better part of 15 years to land in that job. And so you could say, well, Becky, if that was really your career goal, um, it took you an awful long time to execute on that. And that would be a fair observation. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason for that, um, at least in my case, is that um, I've tried to think about career goals sort of in two different parts. Uh, number one, substantive. Um, what are your substantive areas of interest, the areas of law that, get, that you are most excited about and want to focus on? Um, and then two, what are your skills-based goals? Um, how are you going to develop the skills as a lawyer to be most effective in litigating the cases that you care about? Um, and so in my case, I ended up spending um, the first decade plus of my legal practice um, making uh, career decisions primarily based on number two, pursuing the skills that I wanted to develop as a lawyer. Um, that is not the only way to do it. There are many people on this panel, I have many brilliant colleagues at Beckett who um, focus and specialize in First Amendment work much earlier in their careers. Um, but for me, that's how it worked out. And so right out of law school, um, I wanted to know how cases are decided in the federal system. Um, I worked as a law clerk uh, and was really fortunate to have three amazing judges who were extraordinary men, extraordinary mentors, um, and showed me day in, day out, what principled judging um, that binds you to the rule of law looks like. Um, I landed at Gibson Dunn because I wanted to learn how to litigate and um, was recruited there in large part by then Jim Ho, now Judge Ho, um, who taught me how to write as an advocate. Up to that point, I knew how to write as a law clerk, um, very different than writing as an advocate, thinking, adopting strategy as an advocate. Um, so learned a lot at the firm, then decided, you know, what I really would like um, is more opportunities to stand up in federal court. And I'd always had the, in the back of my mind the idea that being an AUSA would be a really fun job. P.S. It is a really fun job. That's a separate conversation. Um, but if you're thinking about it, you should think about it. Um, I wanted the chance to stand up in federal court. I wanted to know what it felt like to look a jury in the eye and say the government's carried its burden. Um, 
the first time you do that, it is terrifying. Um, the second time you do it, it's still terrifying, um, but it's also really fun. And so for me, it was sort of as, um, uh, as a result or at the conclusion of that um, set of experiences that I sort of picked my head up and uh, looked at where I was in life, looked at where the world was, and said, um, you know, I think it's time um, to make the move. And um, at that point, I applied and um, started the job at Beckett. Hmm. Chance, how about yourself? Did you know you wanted to be a constitutional litigator, or did you kind of stumble upon it? Um, so, kind of. I didn't know the constitutional mm -hmm. litigators existed mm -hmm. um, whenever, I got, whenever I got started. I was the um, first one in my family to ever go to college. Uh, my dad was a boxing coach. Um, we ran a boxing gym. I saw early on the way that local regulations could really make it difficult to run a business, um, that ordinary people didn't have a real mechanism to fight back, and that was sort of lurking in the back of my mind for a long time. Uh, when I started college, I actually studied philosophy originally as an undergraduate. I remember I told my dad, he says, so what are you going to study, you know, first weld in to go to college? And I said, philosophy, he says, so you can fully contemplate your own employment. Yes. <laughs> you know, he was, he was not really pleased with that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I eventually decided to go to law school because I really enjoyed arguments and thinking about the law. Um, I thought at the time that I would be able to do some pro bono stuff on the side that would really be fulfilling and the other stuff would really just pay my bills. Um, and then, I guess sort of like a reef, my, uh, after my first year in law school, my 2L year, by the way, I didn't know that you even got clerkships. That was something that you should do in your first year summer. I knew no lawyers. Um, I was teaching logic at the time uh, to make extra money. And I saw an IJ attorney came to a Federalist Society event that I showed up for because I wanted the free pizza. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they talked about the Kilo case. And I remember I pulled it to the side afterwards and I was like, wait, so none of your clients pay you anything? She was like, yeah. And I was like, and you only do cases like this? And she was like, yeah. And I was mm -hmm. like, this isn't a side hustle. She was like, yeah, no, this is all we do. And I was like, tell me more about this magical place. <laughs> and uh, so I went to the IJ Law Student Conference uh, that summer. I ended up working at a, a, a free speech and religious liberty public, small public interest shop as a law clerk that summer. Um, and then immediately afterwards had fellowships uh, at IJ and, and a two-year fellowship at PLF. Uh, where I was doing this sort of public interest litigation. Um, but I was in California, and I'm a Texas boy, and I wanted to come home. Um, so I remember, um, but there was no you know, big firms that do land use stuff that were hiring at the time. And I remember I reached out to a reef at the time, and I said, you know, I'm getting offered a job to do just general civil litigation somewhere. Will that hurt me in the long run if I want to come back and do public interest? And he said, Chance, go litigate. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. He said, go litigate. And it was actually a great, it was a great experience. It's not on my resume. A um, little bit of ambulance chasing going on there at that mm -hmm. firm. Um, but I was taking, you know, four or five depositions a month. I was arguing motions all the time because it was a small litigation shop. I always had like 25 cases on my docket. Um, and I did that for about a year and a half. And I got to tell you, I absolutely hated my life. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was miserable. It was a slave to billable hours. Um, you know, I wasn't, I didn't believe in the stuff that I did. And then, you know, Rob Henneke, when they were launching a litigation center at TPPF, um, I found out that, that they were launching a litigation center and he rescued me from private practice. And I said, I'm never, ever, ever going to leave this place as long as they'll let me keep suing the government. And um, so I, you know, I was, wrote the first line of the first lawsuit that we filed at TPPF. Um, and whenever Rob moved up, I moved into the litigation uh, director role. Um, but that's, that's generally been my path. I think that a lot of people have a different path, um, but um, it's truly a calling. It's truly something that I feel passionate about. But I guess the advice I would have on that would be to say, you know, don't be afraid to go out and get litigation experience first. Don't be afraid to jump right in on public interest um, because all the skills that you have that I've seen, that they apply across the board. And, um, and we'll welcome you back. We'll welcome back if we have some thoughts. Well, I appreciate that. You know, and expect to make mistakes, right? Um, I, uh, you know, you have to embrace your mistakes uh, as you're trying to uh, make the decisions that will impact your life. My wife and I have been married for 25 years, and we got into a little bit of a disagreement a couple of weeks ago, and she said something that she regretted, and she came and apologized to me. I said, honey, don't worry about that. Just embrace your mistakes. And in response to that, <laughs> she hugged me. Um, I don't know if... That was the embrace I was looking for um, and what that was designed to mean. 
Um, but in any event, uh, listen, so if there's people, let's get practical, if there's people out there who want to work at um, entities or organizations like you're at, um, what, you know, what do you recommend? Do you recommend uh, clerking at those entities or judicial clerkships or law firm practice or working for the government? Um, what, uh, Keisha, we'll start with you. Uh, what, what do you, if they want to wind up where you're at, uh, what practically can they do? Just go for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, clerking and working at a law firm first and all of those things, it's not going to hurt, uh, but you certainly don't need it. Um, you know, I went, came, started right from law school um, working at First Liberty Institute, um, and I, I definitely see that there's an advantage to having clerked before or working at a law firm first, but you will learn all the skills uh, that you need to learn. Um, as uh, one of my bosses used to say, you need to paint this plane while it's flying, mm -hmm. right? Like, you'll learn it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it's something that you really want to do, I think if you're already practicing, you can start by being a volunteer attorney. Uh, First Liberty is always uh, looking for great uh, volunteer attorneys to help us on our cases. Um, and that's a really good way to see if this is something that you like. Um, and you know, even as a law student, you can intern um, at any of the organizations and see if it's something that you, you really want to do. And so I would start there. You, know, you just kind of get your feet wet and see if it's something you want to do long term. And then ultimately, you, you can make a decision. I will say that Kelly Shackelford gave me some really great advice uh, when I was an intern at First Liberty. One of the things he said was, if you want to do public interest work, just do it right now. Because um, he, and we know a lot of people who really want to do this work, but they started in big law. And financially, sometimes it's difficult to go from big law to public interest work. Um, make a great living, but it isn't big law, right? So. You really have to make that decision because once you start at that you know, level financially, um, it may be challenging to kind of go backwards. So I, would, I always say just jump in the pool. Um, the water's warm. We'll yeah. welcome you. Yeah. Arif, uh, what do you recommend? Apparently starting at Dell is a good way to start if you want to get into public go. interest uh, uh, litigation. Uh, aside from that, what do, you, uh, what do you recommend? There are many paths in life, but at IJ, most people that end up working at IJ stay there for a long time, and most IJers are known commodities before they become attorneys, in that they've either spent a summer with us during law school, or if not, they have done one of two fellowships that we have for post-law school, one for clerks uh, that they can secure before their clerkship and come back in, and another uh, for attorneys um, that are finishing law school in the early part of their career and they come and do a fellowship and that's, those two are on ramps to IJ. Um, and it's, you know, IJ has grown its recruitment but also its, uh, its student programs and fellowship programs. Um, but the one thing uh, at IJ is, you know, if, if, if the mission that IJ um, has subscribed to and that advances is something that, um, that resonates with you, um, we have folks that come to us and you know, when, when, when the match works, it works. As, you know, there's no one way into IJ, but the one common thing is that because the culture is very special at IJ, most people that get hired on have spent time with us. Um, and they're known commodities and, and, and that's, you know, we keep it simple. Um, and we, we don't overcomplicate things, but we, we do look for uh, clerkship experience. That's, that, that's a nice hallmark to have. Um, but we also look for the intangible that, you know, you have to have the drive. Uh, you have to um, kind of immerse yourself into the area that we're litigating in and, and advocating in. Um, because that's a nice signal to us at IJ that, um, that you'll do the same thing if given the opportunity to litigate with us. There's, it's, it's, we don't have billable hours, um, but you're going to have to marinate in your work and just, it's all encompassing. Writing briefs at night. Sure, I mean, it's because it's fun stuff. And so that's, you know, that, that's the way in. But clerkships, uh, coming in early and letting us know who you are. Matt Lyles is here. I remember when he came in as an, for a non-existent internship at IJ's Texas office and asked to spend some time in the office. Uh, this summer, he's in law school now, he clerked uh, for us. Uh, this summer did a, a student fellowship at headquarters. So now he's, he's a known commodity, he's been there twice. Um, and people that seek out their own opportunities uh, at IJ, um, you know, are, 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 it's easy to notice them because that's a key hallmark of IJ. The entrepreneurial spirit is really uh, something that is, is something that's pervasive throughout IJ. IJers get to kind of work their own docket, uh, create um, amazing cases, uh, drive new things within IJ, uh, 
people that really don't get in their way. And so to have that type of thing replicate throughout the organization requires um, the, a nice mix of both credentials, but also these intangibles, like the entrepreneurial spirit, the drive, uh, you know, the motivation inside, and the principles that, that we share. So Becky, you've done the big law as well as the U.S. attorney. So the big law will hire you right out of law school. The U.S. attorney normally wants you to have um, several years of experience. How, how is it at Beckett? Is it right out of law school or are there things you need to accomplish before uh, Beckett takes a look at you? So we don't hire directly out of law school um, for uh, full-time positions. And we do have a constitutional law fellow program um, that looks at um, generally applicants with a clerkship or two under their belt who are interested in um, spending a year working with us, litigating these cases, um, to understand if that's a, a longer term path for you. Um, I would echo a lot of what's been said. Clerkships are great, firm experience can be great. Um, but I think the, the number one most important thing is to look for opportunities to partner with the organizations or in the space that you are interested in. Uh, Hiram Sasser at First Liberty Institute gave me my first federal court argument five years out of law school. Um, I will never be able to repay that debt to Hiram. Um, he was willing to trust me, in fact, with my two first um, federal court arguments. Um, those were invaluable experiences to me, both in my um, progression as a litigator and also in my exposure to the field of religious liberty law. My first um, opportunity to partner with Beckett was working on an amicus brief. Um, we are always, always um, looking uh, for talented people um, often talented young lawyers who are going to take the laboring oar um, on briefs, uh, either in an amicus capacity or a co-counsel capacity. Uh, we generally all have more work than we know what to do with. And if you raise your hand and say, um, I'm here, I'm interested, think of me next time, um, it may not be next week, but eventually you're gonna get that call. Mm. Chance, uh, what advice do you have for people who are looking to, to land where you're at? So I think, you know, mostly the, a lot of the stuff that's already been said. I mean, folks that go out and get judicial clerkships, that's always helpful, but it's not the, it's not the only way in the door, as, as I'm an example of. I didn't even know that was something you should apply for um, in law school whenever I was coming out. And, um, you know, I think the first thing that we look for when we, when we recruit folks is, you know, are they free to me? to use a word that we use in the office that doesn't exist in the modern lexicon, right? I mean, do they really believe in this stuff? Do they, are they gonna be, do they have the drive to work in this space? Do they think about these broader issues for fun on the weekends? Um, because that's the type of work that we do. Um, and then, you know, just like anything else, it's gonna be a matter of, you know, talent and alignment. Um, we have, you know, a pretty robust summer law clerk program um, we, we hire generally, you know, six law clerks every summer. We have, we take them to all of our hearings. We get to know them. Um, that's been, we have two former law clerks that currently work uh, as attorneys now at TPPF. And uh, some of our other ones have been stolen by the Texas Attorney General's office. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that's really what it is, is, you know, go out, you know, learn about this stuff, show up, you know, go to the Federalist Society meetings, become a known commodity to the folks within the movement, show that you're free to me. Um, and then, you know, just get the talent to litigate and hopefully there'll be, you know, a spot available for you, uh, even though we're a, a relatively small shop. Yeah. Ryan, what about at ADF? Um, do, do you, are you interested in younger lawyers that you're going to teach and train up or do you like them to come to you with some experience? Yeah, we do. I mean, well, we, of course, we're interested in younger lawyers always. Do we have any Blackstone fellows in the house? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. See, so, um, we have uh, the Blackstone Fellowship Program. That's how I was introduced to ADF. And, and that's a very good way to come into the orbit of the institution. Uh, but I would just, more generally, I would echo what everyone on the panel said. You need to build relationships. If you want to work in public interest law, it's a very small world. It really is. Building relationships is very important. Becoming a known commodity is very important. But it's not sufficient. You also have to build skills. And you have to demonstrate excellence in what you do. Uh, those are very important pieces of the puzzle. It's, it's always difficult when someone comes to you and wants a job and they're really nice, but they just have no real skill set. They haven't developed it yet. Um, it is really helpful. Just focus. I think what Becky said is critically important. Uh, the passion is important, but also the drive to develop skills, practical skills, and demonstrate excellence in doing so. Uh, that's really the best advice I can give you. Find people who will invest in you. Look, at, look for jobs where you can work for someone who you look up to and respect, who will, who will invest in you. Look for jobs that will push you and, and push you beyond your limits. Don't allow yourself to get stagnant 
And that can happen in the practice of law. If you find yourself in a role where you're like, I'm doing the same thing over and over again and I haven't been challenged in a while, that's usually a, a yellow or reddish flag that you need to start looking uh, for a change. Either reinvent yourself where you are or look for something new. Um, so I think those are, those are very important pieces of the puzzle when you're looking to enter into the, the public interest space. Right. You know, there's nothing like, as people have said, when, you, when you're in court and that light is on, the judge is looking at you or the jury's looking at you, you definitely can get some stage fright until you get comfortable. And so I would encourage people, as much as possible, speak in public every chance you get, whether it's Bible study class, whether it's at a CLE, whether it's anything, get in front, make your mistakes, flounder around, but get comfortable speaking in front of people so that you're actually communicating instead of uh, focusing on the fear that you have. I can see young lawyers in front of me who are more just focused on being afraid uh, than they are in, in persuading or talking. And so the more that you get in front of people and talk, the more comfortable that you'll get. So let's talk about the non-legal aspects. Uh, Arif, what are some of the non-legal aspects of uh, public interest law uh, that you can uh, share with the audience? One of, I mean, one of the key aspects is the clients. Um, we have to go and find people who are experiencing restrictions on their livelihoods, on their property, on their expression, um, barriers to getting their kids to the school they want, and convince them that it's a good idea to team up um, to take on the government, to take on the licensing agency that governs your very livelihood and take them to court for many years and say, what you're doing is unconstitutional and have the backbone to, to withstand that. Civil forfeiture. It's hard to stand up to DAs after a sheriff has taken your, your, your cash, accused you of a crime but never arrested you or anything. Um, you gotta step back into the ring. So the client work um, is very people-based. It's old school shoe leather public interest lawyering if you wanna do it right. Because when you have a great client, they're standing shoulder to shoulder with you for years. And they frame the issue distilled in the way that uh, you know, the courts should see it, which is the, uh, you know, the Constitution is designed to protect uh, liberty, property, and it's designed to ensure that the majoritarian whims of the political branches don't deprive you of those things. And you know, getting to that point uh, and having the right client is, is everything. So that's one of the areas before you file suit um, it is just developing a case and learning what this person you're gonna represent is dealing with. We go and meet them where they live, wherever that is. Um, we spend time with them, explaining the case, learning everything about them, and by the end of the experience, it's fantastic for them and for us. It's one of the best experiences they've had standing up for their rights and vindicating everyone else's as well. Hmm. So client work um, on the front end before any litigation happens is, um, is a skill that you have to develop. Right. You have to be able to work with people and learn who they are. Becky, how about you? Talk about some of the non-legal aspects and how you can excel in developing uh, skills to be a counselor to clients. I would echo everything Arif said about um, client development. Um, communications is a critical piece. Government affairs is a critical piece. Um, we have um, some really great professionals in those areas that, that I'm learning from on an ongoing basis because we have to partner so closely in order to be successful uh, in the litigation sphere. Um, the slightly less formal piece that comes to mind for me um, is what I would call hearts and minds outreach. Um, I am you know, often in the position of being asked, you know, oh, why religious liberty? What, what does that mean? Um, why religious liberty for everyone? Why would you want to defend people whose view of objective truth is different than yours? Um, it's really important um, that we have um, not only answers, but good answers and accessible answers for non-lawyers uh, to those questions um, because uh, there are cultural battle lines that are often drawn about issues that intersect with our cases. And um, part of our job is being winsome, um, not only in speaking to federal judges, um, but also in interacting with neighbors and friends and other interested citizens. Chance, what advice do you have? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd echo both of them. I think that, you know, one of the things that is really challenging and important in this work is being able to explain sometimes a really complex case to a 12-year-old in 30 seconds and have them understand why you're the good guy. And if you can't do that with your case, then you don't have a good public interest case. If you don't have a 30-second pitch that convinces a 12-year-old that you're the good guy and the other guy's the villain, then that's not, the, that's not a good public interest case. And then, you know, as what Arif said is, you know, I think is true too. So much of this is about relationships with the client. I mean, I remember 
every single client I've ever had. I mean, I sat at their kitchen tables and talked to them about their property or their business. And, and every case is a real person. And it, they're heroes, man. They're absolutely heroes to get someone that can stand up against the Leviathan like that. And they're willing to put, they have real skin in the game. You know, I just get to argue about these things like philosophy for grownups, but they have real skin in the game. And we get so many calls from people that tell us, hey, there's this crazy unconstitutional thing that's going on. And you're like, oh, great. Well, let's sign you up and, and you can fight for this, this cause and we can set good precedent. And they're like, oh, not me, right? You should find somebody else. Um, and so just to get that level of trust from a client, it's a special kind of person that's willing to put their name on a lawsuit. And I remember every single one of their faces, but it's a good skill to, to have, to be able to, to speak to them like a normal human and, and convince them that they need to go with you. And I would say particularly when we first started and they didn't even know who TPPF was, it's gotten a little easier over the years, but at the beginning it was, who are you? Like, what, why, why you? Um, so um, yeah, those two things I think in particular. Ryan, uh, how about yourself when you take your lawyer hat off and you're dealing with non-legal uh, communication and, and counseling to clients, uh, what do you recommend? I, I feel like I'm a retired litigator at this point, mm -hmm. but um, it's what we do is we tell compelling stories and provide compelling narratives to develop and drive social change, to drive change in society. Uh, and we're oftentimes climbing uphill into the wind because let's face it, if you are a conservative and you believe in objective truth, you're probably in a in part of an embattled minority at this point, and you're driving into the cultural headwinds. So we are part of an insurgency. There is no such thing as the moral majority. Um, if you want to do that well, to tell successful narratives well, you have to embrace a, a host of disciplines. And I think um, I'll, I'll tell this through the, the lens of a story, the Dobbs case that many of you heard of. Uh, that case did not just happen out of thin air. That case was years and years in the making. Um, ADF was very involved in crafting and developing the strategy that drove that case, up to and including deciding that we were gonna go for a 15-week ban, drafting the legislation, shopping it, finding a state that would pass it, working the myth of the Mississippi legislature, getting it through the legislature, and then knowing that was gonna be challenged right away, coming alongside the state lawmakers. So that involved legislative advocacy, drafting legislation, long-term strategy, networking, coalition building, ensuring that you're reaching out to all of your partners. No one knew that ADF was actually operating behind the scenes in that case, so being willing not to take credit and allow, being willing to share credit with your partners. That case goes up to the Supreme Court. We actually seconded one of our lawyers to the Mississippi Attorney General's office, Aaron Holly, Josh's wife, um, who helped, helped Scott Stewart with that case. And so all along the way, we're implementing different disciplines, coalition building, communications, helping drive the narrative in the media, uh, working with uh, hundreds of amicus curiae to develop uh, amicus briefs um, to, to put in at the core. We actually had a record number. I think it was a record number of amicus briefs in that case. Um, so all of these disciplines had to come together. And if you, if you, if you listen to what I'm saying, very little of that had to do with Westlaw research. Very little of that had to do with drafting briefs. That was very important and that was critical. But building the architecture around that case to drive social change through a narrative that was winsome and that was persuasive took a lot more than just sitting down at a computer and hammering out a Westlaw search. Mm. It took relationship building, coalition building, years of work, strategic vision, um, and most importantly, being willing to share credit. Mm. So um, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Keisha to weigh in. Uh, at the same time, if you have questions that you would like to ask the panel member, we have microphones on both sides. I would encourage you to, to step up um, and we'll uh, get the panel members to address those as well. Uh, Keisha? Yeah, definitely relationship building is key, not just with clients, but with your colleagues, people who are in this space, because you are not going to be good at everything. And so you need to be able to go to other people, colleagues or people at other organizations and ask for help and ask for tips and ask for whatever. Um, and if you haven't mastered the skill of building those relationships, that's gonna be very difficult for you uh, because you're asking people who may not be involved in your case or may not be assigned to your case to help you with something. Um, and they have to wanna do that. And so that's, I think that's one of the skills I think that, you know, Lawyers sometimes don't develop in a way that's really necessary. Um, and in public interest, it is, is really vital, I think. The other thing is being very resilient because the work that we do can be emotionally taxing. 
Um, we're dealing with principal and we're dealing with sometimes um, these nonprofits that do this amazing work and um, they're, they're on sort of the precipice of, of, of all of that being destroyed. And so if you lose or uh, something doesn't go the way you want, uh, you really have to pick yourself up very quickly and keep going and not kind of be caught up in the emotional um, turmoil that happens uh, when, when you lose. You just have to keep going. Um, and I think that that's really key, particularly in, the, in this space. Um, I think one of the other things I would say is, you know, Chance talked about being able to distill your case in, in 30 seconds, but being able to break down, you know, complex information to a wider audience is important for this, for this kind of work. It's public interest, you're likely going to end up in public talking about your case, and you really need to be accessible. You need people to understand what you're doing, why it's important, why they should care about it, and you probably have less than two minutes to do that. Um, so I would say those three things are, are really key. Mm. So do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Good, uh, good morning. I have a question for you. In, in my, I'm a young lawyer, even though I may, not, I may look a little old to be young, but I'm a young lawyer. But in my limited experience, I've seen people lose property through probate courts and through family law courts where the, the judges just take million dollar properties, put it into receivership, liquidate it. Do you all work with individuals that have some of those type of issues? as opposed to just the typical, the tax man cometh or uh, someone tries to legislate you out of business. So I do this a lot of property rights work, but like all good public interest law firms, we, we have a very focused mission. We can do everything. Right. And so in property, we, we deal with eminent domain abuse, the abuse of civil forfeiture laws, the abuse of fines and fees, um, which all tie in um, in one way or shape or form to property. Um, but one of the reasons we're successful is we're, we're focused on that. So we build institutional expertise, we understand the landscape, we understand what we want it to look like, uh, and then, uh, then we go, go gambusters on it. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of things come our way and, and we can't just get involved. Um, despite, we probably could make some change in the area, but because we've dedicated certain resources to certain mission goals in all of our pillars, uh, staying focused is, and not having scope creep, creep into your mission is really important at, a, as, at a, an organization that handles public interest law. It makes you better, but it also um, keeps everything in line so that you'll actually achieve your mission and not have these different things pulling you away from it. Um, sometimes, though, you might get something just out of the blue uh, that just presents a really interesting constitutional question. Uh, in a context that perhaps we didn't see or think about, maybe the ball bounced differently, and uh, it, it right. presents a really nice a vehicle to to um, to advance the same type of claims that we may want to bring in other types of cases that we do a lot of. Um, so you never know. Hmm. But that's that's my that's my answer. Any, anybody else that looks at property rights from the perspective of the court taking it away without due process? A trial court, I'm talking about, or a probate court. No, we don't deal with property rights very often. I mean, we do, we do, and you know, that that issue can intersect with <clears throat> religious liberty. For instance, the COVID cases, I think, presented an interesting challenge mm -hmm. to religious liberty when churches were told by various government institutions that they had to shut down, especially not inside, not in Texas, not mm -hmm. in Texas, because our political leadership was very cognizant of that, but in other states, um, uh, restrictions on property use. Uh, because of their status as churches. For instance, in Nevada, when the government there told casinos they could operate at 50% capacity, but if you weren't a casino, you could only have 50 people in your building. So churches with 3,000 person capacities had a tiny percentage of their space being used. It was, it was incredibly unfair. Uh, so there are instances where property rights and property use can intersect with religious liberty. Mm -hmm. The extent I have uh, with property rights is protesting my property taxes, unfortunately. So I, I don't know that I can <laughs> offer much. Yes, sir. What's Thank your you. question? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Connor Mile. I work with Chance at TPPF. I know several of you all on the panel. Hey, y'all. Uh, in terms of each of your different organizations, is there an area of law or of practice that you say that you would say you specialize in that makes you unique, or you know? head or shoulders above other organizations in the field? What, what is like one of the unique things that you think that you guys each do well, independent of everybody else? Difficult question, I know. 
I guess I would say, uh, I think we're all really good at building relationships, but I think First Liberty is really great at working with a lot of different law firms in order to accomplish our goals. And so that also allows us to maximize our resources because uh, we can put you know, maybe two or three First Liberty lawyers and then get you know, a law firm that has a gaggle of associates that wants to help. That's a big law firm. You know? And so that, that really helps an organization like us because we're pretty small. Um, and so we're able to maximize everything we do uh, because we're willing to work with different law firms all over the country in order to accomplish our goals. As a managing attorney, and also someone that's been at the IJ for a while, most IJs have worked in multiple areas that we litigate. As we've grown, you start seeing more specialization. Uh, more people might just litigate more school choice cases on the school choice team, for example, uh, or might focus on our project on immunity and accountability, um, which sometimes takes us into family law, actually, but I can't say much more about that mm -hmm. for a few yeah. weeks. Um, and, you know, <laughs> It's, it's, I think it's incumbent upon public interest lawyers to, to, to actually try to litigate cases in the different areas that your, your, your shop litigates in because it builds um, skills which are important that you can translate. If I just did free speech cases, for example, and didn't do federal rational basis cases, I'd get used to having the burden on the government. Uh, and I wouldn't feel what it's like to have everything stacked against you and then winning. Once you do that, then you feel you can litigate anything. Um, and so. You know, I always encourage young lawyers to litigate in several areas of IJ's work because it's very different. Defending a school choice program alongside the government uh, is very different than taking them on. Uh, and having a case where the burden uh, is on the government is very different than the really large uphill battle that you'll get with economic liberty or property rights cases. Uh, but it's more, as Thomas uh, Paine said, uh, the more glorious the triumph, uh, the more the tyranny. So I think most people will end up at, over time maybe specializing more in certain areas. Um, and just really immersing to the doctrine uh, as they become more senior in the litigation shop. And that's important too. Well, I want to thank the panel member. We have a, a, an impressive group uh, that I got to know a lot just by virtue of the fact that we set this panel up and uh, their resumes and what they do for the public interest is uh, something that you just really can't measure. And so um, join me in uh, thanking uh, the panel here. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.